Hi, I'm Adi Sumesfin. I'm a member of the MedStar Orthopedic Institute. And as an orthopedic surgeon, I focus on spine surgery. So cervical means the neck. Stenosis indicates the region where the spinal cord passes through. If we think of it as a tunnel, imagine that tunnel is getting clogged or jammed. That's what cervical stenosis means. The causes of cervical stenosis include a large disc herniation, which can press on the spinal cord. It can also be from arthritis, which can cause pressure on the spinal cord over multiple levels. OPLL is a condition where a ligament, which is typically soft, turns into bone, and because of that, it actually puts a lot of pressure on the spinal cord. We're looking at this area right here, which is C3-C4, where we can see a very large disc herniation. So typically, the spinal fluid is lighter, the spinal cord is here. We can clearly see there's no spinal fluid here, and that spinal cord is getting indented. This is a cross-section. Imagine the patient is laying down, the back of the neck is here, the front of the face is here, and we can clearly see how this football-shaped area, which is typically the disc, has an indentation. There's something coming out here which is pressing on the spinal cord. This is an MRI of the cervical spine or of the neck. In this region, we can see there's a collection that is pressing on the spinal cord. We did a CAT scan or another form of imaging to show this is actually called OPLL, where the fleshy part of this area called the ligament has turned into bone and is pressing on the spinal cord and causing stenosis. Symptoms of cervical stenosis can include changes in balance, can include numbness and tingling in the arms, and also changes in dexterity where patients have problems buttoning buttons, changes in their handwriting, or they're easily dropping things from their hands. Other manifestations can include neck pain or even weakness of the arms or legs. So typically patients don't come in saying, I have cervical stenosis. However, based on the history of the patient, then I'll order an MRI to see how the spinal cord looks. And if I have a suspicion for a condition called OPLL, I'll typically also order a CAT scan. Surgery is not always needed for cervical stenosis. There are many non-surgical options. One simple option is actually to observe the patient and to obtain new MRIs every six months or yearly to see how the spinal cord looks. This really depends on how the patient is presenting. For example, if the patient has cervical stenosis, but they're also having pain in the arms associated with it, then we can try other modalities, including physical therapy or even injections and medications. This patient was a candidate for a motion-preserving surgery called cervical disc replacement. So here we can see on the side view the C3, C4 where the disc replacement is present. And this is a front view where we can see the disc replacement. So there are several non-fusion or less invasive options for cervical stenosis. If a patient is in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, they have not developed much arthritis because of that, they may actually be a candidate for a cervical disc replacement, typically if it's one level that's affected. If a patient develops significant arthritis, then that typically is contraindicated for a disc replacement. Now, there are other options if a patient has several levels that are affected by stenosis. This is called cervical laminoplasty. We typically perform this through the back of the neck, and I think of it as opening a door. We go through the back of the neck, we shave one part of the bone, and the other part of the bone we open fully, and then we actually pry this area open so that we again give this area more room. Going back to the example I gave earlier, if we think of the spinal cord passing through a tunnel, and typically because of the stenosis, that tunnel is jammed or clogged, by opening that area up with a laminoplasty, we provided much more room. And again, this is not a fusion surgery, so the patient is still able to have full range of motion uh, with the surgery. So this is an example of a patient who's had a cervical laminoplasty over multiple levels. And we do place these small implants there to keep the area that we opened from closing up again. 
If a patient is not a candidate for cervical laminoplasty or disc replacement, or has changes in their cervical alignment, a cervical fusion is the next option. This MRI on the left shows how much pressure there is on the spinal cord, and the CAT scan on the right shows there's bony growth in this patient that's pressing on the spinal cord. The image on the left shows a cervical fusion from C2 to, to C6 with instrumentation made out of titanium, as well as a laminectomy being performed which provides more room to the spinal cord. The image on the right is an MRI performed after the surgery which shows how much more room the spinal cord now has after the laminectomy and fusion. Recovery after surgery for cervical stenosis depends on the type of surgery that was performed. If it was a cervical disc replacement, typically the patient stays one night, they have no restrictions on range of motion, and they're able to go home again the next day. If it's cervical laminoplasty, which is typically done through the back of the neck, typically the patient spends two nights in the hospital, they have no restrictions as far as range of motion, we may give them a soft collar to wear as needed for comfort.